Good evening. Good evening. My name is Andy Otto. I'm the pastoral associate here at St. Thomas More Catholic Church. I uh, want to offer just a warm welcome to, uh, to those especially who are visiting here this evening. As a Jesuit parish, uh, we try to offer events and programs that remind us uh, that certainly God is in all things, uh, but that our faith intersects with all aspects of our lives. And we need to continually challenge ourselves in that regard. And so this event uh, is part of that uh, mission of our parish community. Uh, we will have some time for questions um, uh, after the talk this evening. Uh, and we'll take them here on the left-hand side uh, at the microphone. So after the talk, we'll invite you uh, to make a line at the microphone. And we'll have questions for about 20 minutes or so. With that, I'd like to ask um, the pastor of St. Thomas More, Father Mark Borak, to introduce Michael Gerson. Thank you, Andy. Um, we were sent uh, an official bio by Mr. Gerson's agent, uh, and it, uh, it's sort of the, like the standard introduction. And I could read this to you, but I, I don't think it would be uh, particularly interesting or helpful to you. So uh, let me just say, and besides, you, you'd rather listen to him than me. But let me just say that uh, I, I have read Mr. Gerson's uh, columns in the Washington Post for years. Uh, but when I read his article in Atlantic Magazine back in, I think it's the April issue, uh, How Evangelicals Lost Their Way, I said, we got to get this guy down here to St. Thomas More so that we can listen to him. Um, and uh, he's the kind of person that I think uh, most Catholics, if not all Catholics, will feel a real affinity with, have a lot in common with, uh, a man of faith, uh, and I, we're delighted to have him with us here tonight, Michael Gerson. really is a pleasure for me to be here tonight um, at a great community institution among people who are searching for the proper role of faith in our common life. And so thank you for spending your Sunday night with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I should probably make clear at the outset that I'm not a Catholic. Um, I come from an evangelical Protestant tradition. Um, uh, but I have been strongly influenced by Catholic social thought to the point that I often get attacked for being a Catholic. Um, <laughs> uh, recently, I got a real uh, reader email at the Washington Post that just unloaded on me for being personally guilty of every scandal, sacrilege, and abuse by the Catholic Church since the Middle Ages. Um, he called me every name in the book. Um, the email then ended. There is only one good thing that can be said about you, worthless piece of Catholic trash, at least you're not an evangelical. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him. I, um, I've been influenced by Catholic thought. I've never met um, Pope Francis, although I'd very much like to, but I did have two close encounters with John Paul II, one as a journalist and one as a government official. In 1999, I was a reporter assigned um, to Air Force One to cover a meeting between then President Bill Clinton and, um, and John Paul II in St. Louis. This happened to be at the height of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So there was a lot of speculation about the tension between the sinner and the saint. Um, both were pros, of course, so the meeting went smoothly. But I remember vividly being herded backstage after the event and there was a handwritten sign on a door reading, restroom for president and pope only. And I remember thinking, that may be the single most exclusive bathroom in the world. <laughs> in uh, 2004, I had a very different experience uh, traveling with President George W. Bush as a member of the staff to the Vatican and meeting with Pope John Paul II in his simple, unadorned, private apartment. He was bent with pain at that point, with his face in a mobile mask. It was like seeing the suffering of Christ in many ways, the courage and the symbolism and the anguish. Um, the touch of his hand 
really left me changed. Um, it felt like I was in the presence of one of the men called in Galilee. Um, and so that was a, a large influence on my life. My topic this evening is a little more mundane. Uh, some important trends in our political life. Just a few weeks ago, in the midterm election, the Republican Party suffered a major defeat, or as Donald Trump calls it, a major victory. <laughs> After a lifetime engaged in uh, GOP politics at the highest levels, I voted a straight Democratic ticket for the first time in my life. That is either a natural response to an unprecedented electoral situation, or a sign of the end times, take your, <laughs> take your pick. Uh, there's much to say about the midterm election, which returned a measure of accountability to the executive branch, while revealing a series of social cleavages that seemed to render a consensus politics impossible. But my purpose this evening is not to talk so directly about politics. You can do that in the question and answer. Specifically, I'm not going to talk much about President Trump. Some think that it read my column that I have become obsessed with him and are tired of it. My wife Dawn gets the worst of it, so she has imposed a strict rule. For every mention of Trump, she collects a $20 fine, and she is close to buying her Range Rover. <laughs> this evening, I'll talk about some deeper trends, not a red wave or a blue wave, but some cultural ways that political figures fight or ride. These currents ultimately have causes and implications in the realm of ideas, in the realm of philosophy, and I'll talk about that a little. But let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. A few of you may have vaguely recognized me. The most common thing I hear in airports after I made an appearance on Meet the Press or the PBS NewsHour, oh, you're that guy who is not David Brooks. <laughs> I uh, didn't take the traditional Washington path. I was a theology major at Wheaton College in Illinois. As some of you may know, it's a pretty religiously conservative place. The joke on campus when I went there was that the administration had banned premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> but my driving interest was political. I spent some time as a speechwriter and policy advisor on Capitol Hill. I spent some time in political journalism. Then, got, then I got a call from then Governor George W. Bush of Texas who wanted to meet me at a DC hotel. First thing he said to me was, this isn't an interview. I've read your stuff. I want you to write my announcement speech, my convention speech, and my inaugural address. And I want you to move to Austin immediately. At that point, he wasn't even a declared candidate, but I packed up my family and went. From the start, we were a little bit of an odd couple. He is outgoing, social, athletic, likable, and I'm actually none of those things. Um, he has a penchant for locker room humor that makes me uncomfortable. I remember after one policy session at the governor's mansion in Austin, everyone had gone but me, and the governor had some time before his next appointment. He asked me, do you want to hang out a little while? With a rudeness that now seems crazed, I replied, not really, <laughs> which is not the way to treat a future president. But I came to respect Bush as a politician and as a, pers and as a person. He is, above all, a man without a mask. Interest, frustration, boredom, sadness come unfiltered to his face. He is kind and loyal to the people around him. And he can occasionally be sharp-tongued. Every year on the day of the State of the Union, the president sits down with all the network anchors for a time of question and answer. At one of these sessions, I remember, the late Peter Jennings asked him, quote, what does it feel like to go before the nation and read someone else's words? The president immediately replied, you do it every night. <laughs> My uh, life changed direction on September 11th, 2001, like the lives of many people. I was working at home, the president was in Florida, when my deputy at the White House, who was watching events in New York, said I should come in immediately. I was headed into work on a clear morning down Interstate 395 when I saw a plane flying low over the highway headed toward the Pentagon, so low that I could see the windows. Later that day, 
late, days later, I sat in the National Cathedral for the memorial service, and I saw how in a few moments, the words, the rhetoric can really matter to the country. The president said, this world he created is of moral design. Grief and tragedy and hatred are only for a time. Goodness, remembrance, and love have no end. And the Lord of life holds all who die and all who mourn. It's one of the nice things about being a former speechwriter. You can quote the President of the United States and really be quoting yourself. <laughs> the pace of those years, including 9-11 and war and national disaster, was at times exhausting. It has a cost to your health. In December of 2004, while working on the President's second inaugural address, I had a heart attack. The President's doctor had me checked into the hospital under an assumed name to avoid all the press calls. Adding insult to incapacity, there wasn't a single call. <laughs> and it has a cost to your family. Uh, during the heat of the 2004 presidential election, my little boy Nicholas, who was then six years old, announced to me in the car that he wanted John Kerry for president. When I asked him why, he said, so you can be home on weekends. My nine-year-old, who was a little more practical, then said, but how would we eat? <laughs> That's true. I told him, I think I could get a job, I might go to a think tank, and he said, of course, what's a think tank? So I told him, well, it's people who read and speak and have meetings and things. And Bucky, and this is true, said, you mean they don't do anything? <laughs> After the 2004 election, my job at the White House changed. I became a policy advisor focused on global health and development and genocide prevention and conflict areas where my interests had been leading me for many years. And I saw something hopeful. In one of the bitterest times of partisanship in modern history, I also found a number of issues where members of both parties and people of every ideology came together. As part of my job at the White House, I worked with conservative and liberal groups to fight global AIDS and to confront malaria and to oppose global sex trafficking. And I've seen some odd alliances grow. I've gotten to know Bono of the rock band U2 a bit. Several years ago, he invited me to the first rock concert I had ever attended, and it was loud. <laughs> Soon afterwards, my wife and I had dinner with Bono, who is a very idealistic and principled man. After dinner, my wife told me, you may be idealistic and principled, but it would also be nice if you were rich and cool. <laughs> I've um, also met Angelina Jolie. My wife was there too, I think. <laughs> or so she tells me. Now I'm a columnist for the Washington Post, living under the tyranny of two columns a week. I'm an advisor at the One Campaign, an international grassroots organization founded by Bono and dedicated to the fight against extreme poverty and preventable disease. I'll get started with a confession. I actually like most politicians, and I know quite a few of them. They often make tremendous sacrifices of time and money and peace and reputation. But almost uniformly, when I talk to serious public servants, they complain of a political atmosphere more toxic than any they can remember. They complain of forces that seem to make our divisions deeper, and they feel frustrated by their inability to serve the common good. So let me begin by highlighting three trends quickly, three challenges that damage our public life and undermine our best intentions as a people. The first is polarization. I found this figure interesting. We live in a landslide country, just with different outcomes in different places. In the 2016 election, 80% of counties in America gave either Trump or Clinton a landslide victory. In the 1970s, that figure was more like 25% of counties in America. Remember when uh, Pauline Kael, the critic, after the quote I think is fake, supposedly said, I can't believe Nixon won. I don't know anyone who voted for him. This is how now quite plausible in large tracts of the country. We live in increasingly homogenous political communities in silos of the mind. This polarization is not just a function of Washington dysfunction. Americans are self-segregating in a variety of ways 
politically, geographically, culturally. And our views of the opposing camp have become progressively more negative. Here is the conclusion of one recent Pew study. Quote, these days, Democrats and Republicans no longer stop at disagreeing with each other's ideas. Many in each party now deny each other's facts, disapprove of each other's lifestyles, avoid each other's neighborhoods, impugn each other's motives, doubt each other's patriotism, can't stomach each other's news sources, and bring different value systems to such core social institutions as religion, marriage, and parenthood. It's as if they belong not to rival parties, but to alien tribes, end quote. There are many reasons for this state of affair, which I won't go into all of them. The ideological sorting of the parties is a powerful factor. Conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans are increasingly endangered species. And this ideological divide between the parties turns every issue into a culture war battle. There are other factors, the growth of partisan media, including cable TV and talk radio, outlets that provide not information but ammunition. There's the power of technology to mobilize factual interests and allow people to live in filter bubbles. There's gerrymandering leading to the constant fear of politicians that they'll be primary if they lack political purity and party loyalty. The result of all this is the careful weaving of cocoons. One story illustrates this for me. David Wasserman of the Cook Political Report tells of meeting with a group of young Democrats in a wealthy suburban part of Northern Virginia. In the course of his presentation, he made reference to Cracker Barrel voters, those voters in counties with Cracker Barrel restaurants. Donald Trump won 75% of such counties in America. Excuse me, interrupted one of the young liberals. You must have it wrong. Do you mean Crate and Barrel? <laughs> This is an extreme form of a cultural bubble, a life arranged by fate and choice so that other ways of life are just unimaginable. When Americans start seeing their fellow citizens as fundamentally different and dangerous, a line is crossed. Our democratic institutions are designed for disagreement. They are undermined by mutual contempt. Unfortunately, the incitement of contempt can work politically, at least in the short term. We've seen the kind of leadership that fans frustration into fury. The politics of polarization can carry an election, but wreck a democracy. The largest problem with political tribalism is simple. When the other side is viewed as evil, then collaboration is not only hard, it is wrong. Compromise and comedy become not virtues, but vices. And sand is thrown into the gears of government. It's hard for people who care deeply about public events, it's hard for me, to resist polarization. But it has to start with an adjustment of attitude. Here I want to borrow an idea from the Franciscan priest Richard Rohr. He says that the prophetic stance is to, quote, live on the edge of the inside. Prophets fully belong to the community, but they have just enough distance to see it with clear eyes. Or says, quote, to live on the edge of the inside is different than being an insider, a company man, or a dues-paying member. Yes, you have learned the rules, and you understand and honor the system as far as it goes, but you do not need to protect it, defend it, or promote it at any cost. It has served its initial and helpful function. You've learned the rules well enough to know how to break the rules without really breaking them at all not to abolish the law, but to complete it, as Jesus rightly puts it. A doorkeeper must both love the inside and the outside of his or her group and know how to move between these two loves, end quote. We should strive to be doorkeepers of our ideological tradition, committed but not blind in our commitment, knowing both the inside and outside of our group and finding sympathy for both. So polarization is the first trend. The second, confirmation bias, is related. No matter how good we think our case is, we are probably not going to argue our way to unity. Social science reveals something I find unsettling. The more knowledge that political partisans have, it turns out, the more stubborn they become in their beliefs. 
The largest problem is not so-called low information voters. It is people who use their brain power to support the views of their tribe. So Republicans, for example, who have higher levels of scientific knowledge are actually more skeptical of global warming, even though the evidence for climate disruption by any objective standard, at least in my view, is compelling. Consider one example. When social scientists showed aerial pictures of Donald Trump's inaugural crowd and Barack Obama's inaugural crowd, which was clearly bigger to voters, many who supported Trump thought his crowd was larger. They were not lying. They were demonstrating that group commitments often have more power than reason itself. Confirmation bias is not only absurd, but destructive. In a 2006 survey, a majority of Democrats in America agreed it was likely or somewhat likely that George W. Bush was complicit in the 9-11 attack. In a 2015 poll, 43% of Republicans believed that Barack Obama is a Muslim. One gets the impression in both cases that partisans would have agreed with any polling description they perceived as negative. People seem eager to use whatever stick comes to hand. How do we begin to confront this deep human tendency? I think it begins by being willing to call out your own side, to make a fair judgment no matter who it benefits. Calling out the other side really doesn't work very well. When Obama criticizes conservatives or when Trump criticizes liberals, views are only entrenched. But it is different and powerful to police your own. Be an advocate, even be a partisan, but show intellectual honesty. It has never been more important. I've met some politicians willing to do this, willing to do this. Senator Jeff Flake has often played that role in the GOP, as Senator Chris Coons, a friend of mine, has played that role in the, De in the Democratic Party. And politicians like former Senator Bob Dole have a habit of calling it like it is. In 1996, I remember then Speaker Newt Gingrich had a 16% approval rating in the polls. At one event, he turned to Dole and asked, Bob, why is it that people take such an instant dislike to me? Dole replied, Newt, because it saves them time. <laughs> At least that's the way Dole tells it, um, who I worked for during his presidential run in 1996. He has a famously sharp tongue as well. I remember him saying that Al Gore was so stiff, his Secret Service code name was Al Gore. <laughs> the hardest thing is to confront confirmation bias in ourselves. It would be difficult for me, to be honest, to praise good and important things accomplished by the president. All of us have the tendency to seek an enemy when we really need a mirror. We also need to seek an enemy when we need a certain kind of friend. For me, it has been important to have friends like E.J. Dion with very different views than my own. It shows me that deep disagreements can also be honest disagreements, and it helps expose when I am guilty of groupthink. Here I'll borrow an idea from the Christian author C.S. Lewis. He talked of the need for what he calls first friends and second friends. The first friend, he said, is the alter ego, the man who first reveals to you that you are not alone in the world by turning out beyond hope to share all your most secret delights. But the second friend is the man who disagrees with you about everything. Of course, he shares your interests, otherwise he would not, he would not become your friend at all. But he has approached them all from a different angle. He has read all the right books, but has gotten the wrong things out of every one of them. And then you go at it, hammer and tongs, far into the night, night after night, each learning the weight of each other's punches. Actually, though it never seemed so at the time, you modify one another's thought out of this perpetual dogfight, a community of mind and deep affection emerge. In this time of division, mistrust, and motivated reasoning, I think all of us could use more second friends. My third and final point has some added urgency because of recent political events. The destination of our divided politics, unless we turn aside, is dehumanization. There is life and death, the scriptures say, in the power of the tongue. Words can provide permission for prejudice. I have a friend at the University of Pennsylvania, a researcher named Emil Bruno, 
who has been studying politics in the country of Hungary. Emil has devised a disturbing scale to measure blatant dehumanization. In September of 2014, a sample of Hungarians was asked to place Muslim migrants somewhere on the familiar Ascent of Man scientific illustration, the one that shows the gradual development from ape to homo sapiens. Not long afterwards, the right-wing populist government stepped up its anti-immigrant rhetoric and built a barbed wire fence across the border to keep refugees out of the country. After this controversy, the same survey was conducted. The level of dehumanization in Hungary had doubled in a single year. He concluded that violent and dehumanizing political rhetoric can increase support for violence among people already predisposed towards aggression. Here I can't avoid the current moment. And I can't avoid being blunt. In our recent election, the president's final political appeal was literally to warn that brown people were invading the country. Then he promised to have them shot. It was racism unadulterated. His base of support, millions of people skewing white and male, found this message acceptable or compelling. There is no denying that dehumanization has become explicit in our public discourse. Refugees are referred to as animals. Mexican migrants are called rapists. Muslims are treated as threats. Jews are tagged with ancient stereotypes. This type of language, says David Livingston Smith, quote, acts as a psychological lubricant, dissolving our inhibitions and inflaming destructive passions. As such, it empowers us to perform acts that would, under normal circumstances, be unthinkable. Great words can heal and inspire. It follows that base words can corrupt. I think there is a connection between a public ethic of bigotry and acts of violence by people unbalanced by bigotry. And I think that the evidence was recently on full of display in Pittsburgh in the synagogue shooting. Dehumanization has a natural progression. It starts by defining a whole race or, ethnic or ethnicity by its worst members. It moves on to enforce generally applicable laws and rules that especially hurt a target group. Then, as the public becomes desensitized, the group can be singled out for hatred and harm. It is the descent, step by step, into a moral abyss. It is not often that a nation is presented with a choice about its most basic founding beliefs. At one blessed moment in our history, the answer was that all are created equal and endowed with rights by our creator. It is a belief that judged our social practice in many ways through the years. But haltingly, eventually, the idea has invaded our laws and our conscience and changed us. This is my honest fear, that a new and lesser ideal will take hold, that the strong matter more than the weak, that the winners are superior to the losers, that human dignity stops at certain borders and certain groups and certain religions. I am afraid this ideal will invade our laws and our hearts and change us. All these trends, polarization, confirmation bias, dehumanization, existed before our current president, but they seem to have culminated in our time. They've led to disagreements that are so much deeper than normal politics can repair. Americans have not just different party homes but different, and different policy views, but different values. A political scientist named Rob Willer calls this moral polarization. There are many structural reasons for political division, but I don't have any structural answers for moral polarization. The response here can only gather life by life and choice by choice. The answer will be spiritual. Not in the sense of piety, but in the sense of mutual grace. There is really only one force that can overcome moral polarization. It is empathy. It is the ability to put ourselves in the shoes of another, of a different party, of a different faith, of a different class. The failure of empathy is ultimately a moral and spiritual matter. Our nation is in need of healing and truth and humanization. And religion has traditionally been one source of these commitments. Here, on the theory of calling out your own, I'll focus a little bit on my own tradition. 
My alma mater, Wheaton College, was founded by abolitionist evangelicals in the mid-19th century. Its first president, Jonathan Blanchard, was an anti-slavery agitator and founder of radical newspapers. The college was a station on the Underground Railroad. Many northern evangelical Christian leaders at the time were malcontents in the cause of human dignity. Who could possibly describe conservative Christianity in those terms today? The predominant narrative of white evangelicalism is tribal rather than universal. Christians who once said America's moral and political terms, the argument goes, are now under legal and cultural siege by the forces of secularism. Now they must find political allies and fight back before they are thrown to the lions. Here's a recent revealing quote from Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council. Conservatives, he said, quote, were tired of being kicked around by Barack Obama and his leftists. And I think they are finally glad that there's someone on the playground that is willing to punch the bully. In this explanation, Trump's approach to public discourse is actually the main selling point. His bullying, his cruelty, crudity, and personal insults are admired because it is directed as what they see as other bullies. This attitude is perhaps politically and psychologically understandable from any group that has lost cultural influence. But it has almost nothing to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Nothing to do with any rec recognizable version of Christian ethics. The very thing that should repel Christians, Trump's dehumanization of others, it's what seems to fascinate and attract some conservative Christians. It is the worst kind of discrediting hypocrisy. The Trump religious conservatives are best understood as political operatives seeking benefits for their interest group from politicians who are most likely to provide them. This, provide, this involves a certain view of power, the belief in power as political clout used to serve your own. So how good is the quality of this political judgment? Not particularly good. Identifying conservative Christianity with ethno-nationalism may have some short-term be benefits, particularly when it comes to things like judicial nominees. But public influence eventually depends on the persuasiveness of public arguments. And close ties to Trump will eventually be disastrous to causes that conservative Christians care about. Pro-life arguments are discredited by an association with misogyny. Arguments for religious liberty are discredited by association with anti-Muslim bias. Arguments for family values are discredited by nativist disdain for migrant families. And the ultimate harm is to the reputation of faith itself. The identification of Christianity with white grievance is a grave matter. Conservative Christians hardly distinguished themselves during the civil rights movement. Some used Christian academies to cover or continued segregation. Getting this issue wrong again would be particularly damning in a nation and in Christian churches growing inexorably more diverse. According to a recent Pew uh, Research Center poll, white conservative Protestants are the least likely group in America to affirm an American responsibility to accept refugees. The least likely group in America. Conservative Christians insist on the centrality and inerrancy of scripture and condemn society for refusing to follow biblical norms, and yet when it comes to verse after verse requiring care for the stranger, they don't merely ignore this mandate, they oppose it more than anyone else. How can this possibly be? This state of affairs represents the failure of Christian political leadership in many traditions. Even more, it indicates the failure of the Christian church in the moral formation of its members who remain largely untutored in the most important teachings of their own faith. Where is the moral formation of many religious Americans taking place? On social media that has increased the velocity of lies and conspiracy theories. On cable stations that make money through incitement. On talk radio that paints every opponent as an enemy of the country on internet sites that trade in racism and anti-Semitism. I don't have answers for all of this, but I will make one claim. It would be helpful for Christian political engagement to have some root in Christian ideals. This is a matter of getting our theological principles right and teaching them boldly and clearly to people in the pews. 
to stand for something better and higher than our degraded discourse, something better and deeper than our tired, angry, angry ideologies, something just better. There are a few common powerful themes in the Christian tradition, in the Catholic tradition, in the best of the Protestant tradition, broadly defined. A distinctly Christian approach to public engagement begins with a certain anthropology, a view of human beings, their rights and dignity. There are many elements of the Christian faith that are frankly, that have frankly no political significance at all. Christian soteriology, a theory of salvation, Christian ecclesiology, theory of the church, are hugely important, but they have no proper place in public life. Yet a Christian anthropology, a transcendent vision of human rights and dignity, has grabbed reformers and activists in every generation by the collar and never let them go. They have carried the same message of human worth, a message that all of us have significance, not because of what we know, but because we are known, not because of what we achieve, but because we are loved, known by God, loved by God, valued and welcomed by God across every race, across every border, across every division. This is not just a private moral matter. It is what the political scientist Glenn Tinder calls, quote, the major premise of all Christian political and social thinking, the concept of the exalted individual. It is rooted in, in the universality of God's love. It means there is a spiritual destiny for every soul carried into limitless time. It involves the recognition that all of us, even you, even me, even everyone, share a legacy of dignity and worth. The Christian universe, says Tinder, is peopled exclusively with royalty. It also imposes the humility of knowing that this legacy is fully shared. In every way that matters to God, human beings are completely equal and completely loved. They can't be reduced to ethical object lessons. Their dignity runs deeper than their failures. They matter more than any cause. They are the cause. The opposite of dehumanization is humanization. That commitment can be reflected in many callings, in every calling, really. We need a journalism that vividly describes worlds that are not our own, invites us to enter them in positive ways. We need a politics that calls us the common good, not the triumph of our tribe. And we need religious leaders who emphasize the imago day, not the controversy of the day. Priests and pastors are generally not experts on public policy and should not pretend to be. Many of the debates surrounding, say, the, immigration, uh, the issue of immigration are prudential rather than moral. There's no specifically Christian position on, say, border security. Some approaches may be stupid and wasteful, but it's not inherently unethical. But religious leaders have a solemn duty to oppose the dehumanization of migrants, something that violates the vision of human dignity and equality at the heart of the Christian faith and other faiths as well. Human beings in this view are not merely arrogant hominids programmed for sex and death. They bear God's image. And in the Christian view, their flesh somehow once clothed God himself. This means that cruelty, bullying, and oppression are, are cosmic crimes. This leads to another theological principle. A distinctly Christian approach to social engagement requires a commitment to the common good. Pope John Paul II defined this as, quote, the good of all and of each individual because we are really responsible for all. It is the set of social circumstances that allows anyone, everyone to flourish. At one level, Christianity is deeply individualistic, promising a personal relationship with the creator and imposing a set of individual moral responsibilities. But Christianity is also inherently communitarian. What my friend Jim Wallace describes as, quote, the call to a relationship that changes all our other relationships. The golden rule and the mandate to love your neighbor challenge social systems based on tribe, class, or race. Christian ethics has been the halting, inconsistent, but continuing struggle to draw out the full implications of God's image in every life. Against libertarianism, the common good is not identical to the triumph of market forces. A 
against some forms of modern liberalism, the common good is not identical to the triumph of autonomy and choice. And against secularism, the common good is not achieved by banishing religion from the public square. Religious institutions perform works of mercy, carry ideals of justice, and should be sheltered by a generous interpretation of religious liberty. John Chrysostom wrote, this is the rule of the most perfect Christianity, its most exact definition, its highest point, namely the seeking of the common good, for nothing can so make a person an imitator of Christ as caring for his neighbor, end quote. In a political era of rights talk and special interest pleading, a greater emphasis on the common good would make American politics more civil, admirable, and humane and it would make clear that Christians do not constitute one pressure group among many. Instead, they seek the good of the whole. A distinctly Christian approach to social engagement must take seriously the idea of the kingdom of God. How believers understand this concept determines much about the nature of their political engagement. If you look at his words, Jesus did not preach a new religion. He announced the arrival of a kingdom. The kingdom of God has come near, he said. It is intended to be a message of dawning hope and liberation. Quote, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance for the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that were bruised. This kingdom, against the messianic expectation of some of Jesus' followers, did not involve a revolt against the Roman Empire. It is, Jesus said, not of this world. He said that the rule or reign of God had broken into human history in some new and different way. And the evidence is provided by people who will live by the values of this divine kingdom in the midst of every earthly kingdom. Believers are essentially called to be emissaries or ambassadors of God's kingdom. This involves an entirely different view of power. Power for the sake of the powerless, involves a different definition of influence, bringing a modicum of grace and justice into the world around us, including the political world. This commitment does not lead towards a single party or ideology, but it does trace the outlines of, agenda, of an agenda, defending the rule of law, protecting minorities from discrimination and harm, fighting against trafficking and preventable suffering abroad, standing up for the rights of the disabled and vulnerable, shielding children from exploitation and abuse. This is the evidence of the kingdom of God in our midst. And finally, a distinctly Christian approach to public engagement requires us to remember our history and recover our heroes. It is my theory that people cannot be the leaders they need to be until they remember who they once were. And this is also the theory of my new book contract with Simon & Schuster. I have uh, less than a year to write a series of profiles of American and British men and women who have modeled Christian social engagement over the last 200 years. So far, it is my experience that most religious people are almost entirely ignorant of their own history. It is also my experience in starting my research that this history is rich beyond measure. There are the great heroes of 19th century evangelical social reform who stood up to slavery and confronted the squalor and exploitation of the Industrial Revolution. There are the voices of the African-American prophetic tradition, tradition who were the instruments by which a hypocritical nation was called to its own ideas. There are the men and women influenced by Catholic social thought, the defenders of immigrants and of solidarity with the poor and weak. And there are the representatives of the social gospel who embrace both sacrificial service and progressive reform. I have no idea who will actually read such a book, or more importantly, buy such a book. But hopefully there is some value in giving people back their history. Without the influence of these religious traditions, America would have been a colder and crueler and less just place. And without recalling these examples, I don't think we will find the inspiration to move forward. I want to close on a point of inspiration. In the face of division, anger, and verbal violence, faith calls attention to a hopeful alternative. One of the greatest lessons of life and one of the deepest lessons of cultural change is the ability of compassion and generosity to break down even thick walls of contempt. 
when I met the Dalai Lama a few years ago, he talked about the power of the, quote, undiplomatic smile to melt human barriers. There is the power of the kind word and unexpected favor, the genuine compliment. It is the strange alchemy of empathy. We serve our principles best by loving people even more than our principles. This is not flabby or passive. At least it wasn't for Martin Luther King Jr. Love has within it redemptive power, he said, and there is power there that eventually transforms individuals. Just keep being friendly to that person. Just keep loving them, and they can't stand it too long. Oh, they reach, and they react in many ways in the beginning. They react with guilt feelings, and sometimes they'll hate you a little more in the transition period. But just keep loving them, and by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. Here's the redeeming value of our moment. Viruses create their own antibodies. We value more dearly what, we might, what might be lost. We have had a taste of nihilism and chaos. We have looked into the abyss, and we know this cannot be our destination. I'm confident in the long run that people will choose decency and shared progress over the cruel pleasures of blame and spite, or so I try to believe. The best example of this possibility took place in Charleston, following the racist church shooting that took nine lives at the Emanuel African, Ameri African Methodist Episcopal Church. The killer chose a historic African American church for a reason. For centuries, black churches have been a place of refuge, a voice of social justice, and a target of racist violence. The gunman drove two hours to Charleston, South Carolina, because he undoubtedly wanted a symbol, and he got one. Against all his intentions, it is now the symbol of a living faith. The killer set out to defile a sacred place and end up, ended up showing why it is sacred. When many of the relatives of those cruelly murdered in Charleston publicly offered their forgiveness of the shooter, it was stunning and admirable in many ways, not least of which it provided a contrast to our political culture. So many are engaged in a search for evidence of their own victimization in order to justify their anger. Here, genuine victims of a horrible crime responded with mercy. The heart of the Christian faith is an impossible demand to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. This teaching was demonstrated by its author. The novelist George MacDonald wrote, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do, said the divine making excuse for his murderers, not after it was all over, but at the very moment when he was dying at their hands. When we see this kind of extreme grace reenacted, as in Charleston, it has tremendous power. At some level, it is simple. Christians gain influence, real, lasting influence in the world when we act like Jesus. When people, including modern, cynical people, see the image of Jesus even partially reflected in another human being, it appeals across every distinction, every division, every boundary. It stirs the deepest longings of the human heart. When the representatives of Christ act like Jesus, true influence returns, and that is the only kind in the end worth having. Thank you very much. Happy to take some questions, and it doesn't have to be on the speech. It could be about American politics. That's my day job. So. Suppose a politician were to build a candidacy on uh, those principles that you were talking about: the image, humans created in the image of God, the purpose of uh, the state to seek the common good, and other social cap Catholic social teaching principles. How would such a politician fare, do you think? Well, I don't want to be too pessimistic. I look at, these are not perfect examples, but you look at what uh, Tony Blair did with the reform of the British Labour Party, making it a 
different party in many ways, um, from being a leftist socialist party to being really a policy-oriented modern party. You look what um, Bill Clinton did with the New Democrats in the 1990s, which really you know, moderated a cultural message and was uh, talked a lot about you know, issues that were important to people's lives. Um, you look at what you know, some people are dismissive, including within the party, but in the year 2000, when we talked about compassion for service, it was, it was really an attempt to embody some of these principles from a conservative and market-oriented perspective, um, particularly in trying to promote the work of private and religious institutions in the provision of social services. Um, so it's not as though these ideas have never uh, had any influence. I, I had the, you know, the uh, experience of doing something everyone should do if they have HBO, which um, many may not, but um, they had a uh, documentary called RFK for President that was on Robert Clinton's run for president. Um, and I came away crying at the end because of how different the idealism of that moment in the bitter chaos of the 1960s, how different it is from our own. You look at one of my, I'm a speechwriter, a former speechwriter, one of my favorite speeches in American history is um, Robert Kennedy's speech on the night that Martin Luther King was killed. He was in Indianapolis giving a speech to an African American audience. He actually tells the audience that King was killed. They didn't know beforehand. There's like a uh, gasp in the crowd. Um, and then he makes a case that America faced a conscious choice between hate and love. And talked about his own family, his own loss of his brother and how he could have turned a different way. Um, and it was really an extraordinary moment in American political rhetoric. And it makes you think, well, politics can be like this under certain circumstances. It's not impossible. Um, not that the people like that are perfect men. Um, but if you look at what was embodied in, uh, you know, I've gotten to know um, Tim Schreiber very well. His father, Sh Sergeant Schreiber, was a great Catholic politician and embodied many of these principles. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I look at what um, Eunice Schreiber did with the Special Olympics. And, um, there are, I, it's not as though they were devoid of examples. Um, and, um, but, you know, right now, we, We'll get into it more, but my biggest concern is we no longer have a central right party that can carry that kind of message. We have an ethno nationalist party at the national level, uh, a right wing populist party um, that is not capable of carrying that message basically because its political principle is the fear of the other. I mean, that's the, the way it's organized, it's organized in principle. I'm afraid of what's going on with the Democratic Party as well. I wouldn't provide much of, as much of a criticism, but I think they're moving in directions that could lead to, to having no center left party in America. Um, and um, so, I, you know, those are real problems, but I guess, uh, you know, if you look at the 1960s, they were bleak times in America, the late 1960s. And there were politicians that brought us back. <laughs> more humane politics in there. So I don't think it's impossible. This is a quote from Al Hayes for a while ago. Um, my, and I like the reaction. My department had a down and dirty test for whether our country was a democracy or not. Did it have a free and functioning labor board? If it did, then it was a democracy because it allowed that part of its society I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I think that um, I mean, Catholic social thought in many ways was bound up with the development of the labor movement, movement in the United States. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the most important of the uh, mediating structures. I mean, I think one of the great things about American history that Tocqueville and others describe is that we have a very strong, thick range of institutions between the government and the individual that mediate power, that diffuse and mediate power. Um, 
I think unions play their role. I think private and religious charities play their role. I think churches play their role essentially. Um, and I, my type of conservatism, a kind of Burkean conservatism, is very much oriented towards the this, this health and strength of the civic sector as being the, the measure. I would broaden it a little bit beyond unions. I'd put some other groups in that category. But I think the insight is exactly right. It's, um, you know, the sad thing, like in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, is because the government had destroyed, infiltrated, and undermined so many of those mediating institutions in society that when, um, uh, when that government was removed, People did not have the habits and character to work in a, in, a, um, in a capitalist system. And it became a, a brutal social Darwin system because all of our I mean, it's basic ideal of the founders that um, people have to be prepared through the exercise of self-government by learning certain democratic virtues the way we treat one another, the way that we view um, the freedom of others, the way that we um, approach tolerance and other issues. Um, and I think a healthy civic sector is what, where that instruction takes place, where we learn to relate to people in ways that are not telling them what to do through government, or not atomistic individualism, but by which we come together in voluntary ways to shape a more just society. Um, and so, you know, that I think is powerful political insight. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, taking off on this idea of the total, which, as you know, has a lot to do with the Catholic and uh, natural law tradition of subsidiarity, the idea of freeing up families, localities, neighborhoods, and free associations like the Little Sisters of the Poor, or the Knights of Columbus, or Civic Hands. Do you think it's possible that you can make a distinction between Trump, Trumpism, and true conservatism. And here's my question. For those Americans who are not racist or monolithically uh, ethno-nationalists, who might have voted for Trump not because they like his style or rhetoric, I know I do, but they voted on the basis of domestic jobs first, pro-life, pro-tradition. They didn't believe in late-term abortions like many Catholic senators voted for, limited government, and a prudential ma maintenance of borders. Is it possible in your, in your uh, view to make a distinction between um, principles or positions like that and the untoward rhetoric of Donald Trump? Yeah. It's a very good question. And let me uh, complicate it a little bit, because um, I think in my own political worldview, that the choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton was not an easy choice for a lot of people um, because of those policy issues that you mentioned. Um, and I had family members and friends vote for uh, 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 Trump under those circumstances because it was a binary choice. Okay. My criticism, particularly religious leaders that support Trump, though, has been once that choice that may or may not have been justified, but at least understandable, is made, and the president becomes the president, um, then why not hold them to account according to Christian principles? I mean, you essentially have had a lot of people who have been providing preemptive excuses for horrible behavior to the president. Um, it's like, yes, there was a binary choice that had to be made, but after that choice was made, why not hold them to, to account? Why not you know, embody these values? And so that, you know, I know a lot of the religious leaders who, who support him. I, in fact, I have a long history of a political alliance with them. Um, but I don't think they're, they're playing that role. They're, they're essentially becoming part of a political coalition, loyal members of a political coalition in order to get benefits and access. And that, to me, is not the proper way to approach these issues. Um, you know, Christians, in many ways, as your question and some of the others imply, um, are always a little bit homeless in American politics. They have a 
view of justice, human rights, and human dignity that is not identical to either of the uh, major ideologies and parties in America, or the, you know, the political views in 16th century Russia or in anywhere. Okay, I mean, I think that the, the uh, Christianity really, in many ways, holds all ideologies to account according to a set of very basic principles. Um, and that means I find problems in both parties. Um, I mean, serious problems. We do not have the option. I, you know, I always feel a little more comfortable when I go um, to a country like Germany that has the history of a Christian Democratic Party, okay? Because the, they were very Catholic in their creation, and it was really a communitarian conservatism based in, in uh, Catholic and Christian sources. We really don't have that. We have a we don't have that option in American politics right now. Even then, it was not identical. This is what I, I mean, to be honest, what I wanted to do with compassion and conservatism, to give people an option on the right in America that says we believe in the common good, we believe in individual dignity, we, but we also believe in free markets and we believe in um, uh, the primacy of community and subsidiarity. Um, and um, so, you know, we can make a vote, uh, you know, where we cover more of that ground. Um, but I don't, I just don't see it right now. I mean, it's, I can't get to the point, I'll, I'll stop here, but I can't get to the point of saying that the president's problems are just stylistic. Okay. We saw what the problems were at the end of the last election. We had a president of the United States where you had an uh, economic growth rate above three and a half percent. You had an unemployment rate below 4%. You have one of the best economies in modern American history. And the President of the United States, his closing message is hatred of migrants. I mean, it made no political sense whatsoever. Um, and, you know, that to me, it indicates something deeply wrong. This is not just a political strategy. This is a way of doing politics. Um, Well, I'll say a couple things real quickly. Um, one of them is I'm fundamentally open to it. And I think that it may, if the president is, regains the Republican nomination, which I think is likely, and is reelected president, there may be very little option because his control of the Republican party will be cemented. I mean, it will be complete. Um, and there may not, not be an option of reform within the party. But that would be a very tough moment because of how deeply rooted the American party system is in the American political system, and has been for a long time. The way we nominate candidates, the way we get people on ballots, the way everything relates to, uh, to the party process. And I've gone, I've been involved in three presidential campaigns. I don't know how you would do it outside of the normal system. It's very hard. Now you can run a viable third party campaign like Ross Perot did that can affect the outcome of an election. But, but I think it's very, it's going to be very hard to start from scratch with another party in America. Yeah. Actually, I have a comment that's kind of
face it, it, it helps a lot of people to have a toxic environment. We did record donations to politics this, this year in the most toxic environment that's ever been. So one thing that brought up was, yeah. <laughs> one thing that brought up was um, the centrist project. And the idea was that you're never going to get a third party because too many laws are written already to prevent a third party for ever having a chance. A, a great example is that Gary Johnson was never allowed to, to debate, which was a crime. Um, but, you know, they, they basically, the two parties <laughs> shut it down, and, you know, the media helps that, too. Um, so, at any rate, I don't know if the Centrist Project would work, but it's something to look at. What they're saying is trying to find uh, center left and center right, especially senators, because they can block um, you know, a lot of things from happening that are very extreme, you know, very polarizing. So that was one of their projects. One thing that, I, one other comment I, I do want to make is that, as you said, the evangelicals tend to be very, very right, including even more right. Other religions, maybe Jewish religion, tends to be more liberal. But Catholics over decades have moved back and forth. I think they were a little bit more conservative in the 80s and then started moving few years, so we are kind of the, the centrists, and I think a lot of it has to do with what, what you said, what the teachings that Father Mark, uh, you know, um, tells us, uh, I think those things are going to be really important. I, I totally agree with you, Senator, on that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I, I'm going to be skeptical about one thing, though. Um, if you look at the voting patterns of white Catholics, they're very similar to The difference is that a third of the Catholic Church in America is Hispanic. And so you have a church that has expanded its priorities in natural ways because of the constituents of the church, which I think is a very good thing. Um, but um, if you look at you know, white, older uh, voters, uh, Catholic voters were very strong. And um, so I think the problem I was describing of the, the moral formation, where does moral formation happen, um, is true in a bunch of different churches, Catholic and Protestant. Um, I think Catholicism has a 100-year tradition that is the most developed tradition of social thought of any Christian community. It's really an unbelievable, admirable thing. When I went to Washington and was looking for models of social engagement as a young Capitol Hill staffer, I turn to Catholic sources because that is really subsidiarity and solidarity and all these principles are, are, are the right ones. Um, but I wish that there was more evidence that, um, that people were taking those, um, those principles and putting them into political and I do think that there's a problem here. I, I go to a lot of places, and you mentioned the media, which is an important thing. Um, so you have this weird, like on CNN, this weird symbiotic relationship between the excesses of the president and the coverage of CNN. Okay. I go on CNN every once in a while, and they're not bad people, but they have benefited immensely from the complete conquest of that space. And a lot of news media has. The Washington Post and the, and the New York Times are doing better than that, um, particularly because of their investigative journalism in the era of Trump. Um, and, um, and then there are things like MSNBC and Fox News, which are businesses with business models. I mean, they use um, ideological methods to gain uh, viewers by hitting certain themes. I mean, they do it purposely. And, um, uh, you know, that I think, uh, you know, I, I talked in the speech about how those institutions provide ammunition, not information. The goal is to take your pre-existing views and incite them in order that you'll watch every day. And that, I think, has been a terrible influence. I'm kind of hopeful that what you were saying about, you know, we have a lot of monopolies and duopolies and other things that are shattering 
because of the new way that our information is organized. Okay. In a very weird way, um, you know, Donald Trump was able to pursue a non-traditional campaign, uh, essentially have a coup within a, a, one of the main parties in America, a hostile takeover of one of the parties, because of a new method of communication, um, a highly decentralized uh, approach, where you hardly had any traditional campaign, gave no policy speeches, you know, had very little uh, paid advertising, it was all free advertising. Um, Twitter became the main tool. I've never seen anything like that. I used to know how to run for president. I was involved with it, but I don't know how now. I mean, it's very different. The, there are a lot of plenty of bad things that have happened because of the decentralization of power through the changing um, communication technology. The question is whether we, we start, can start to get some good ones, too, about the kind of organization that might take place outside of political parties through new methods um, that, would, you know, all of the institutions in our common life um, are, have less respect than they used to, has less strength, less membership. I mean, we're in a real institutional crisis in a certain way. People no longer believe in institutions the way that they once did. Um, but the question is whether, what can you then use that, the way that, you know, organize that, uh, movements can organize themselves, essentially self-organize now, in a way that's socially productive and not socially dis destructive. I think that's going to be an important question as we go forward, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's a, it's a valid question. Um, let, let me give you one example, because I've been, I've spent 20 or 25 years being a critic of the Republican Party, not a supporter of the Republican Party, for a certain reason. So, you know, I remember the um, Mitt Romney convention okay, that was down in Florida. I was a journalist at the time, or a columnist at the time. I sat on the floor of that convention forced myself to listen to speaker after speaker after speaker. Um, and the overwhelming impression I came away with was the assumption of every single set of remarks. This is pre-Trump, and it may explain them to some extent. The assumption of every single set of remarks was as though they were, that every American were an entrepreneur. Okay. It was all about taxes and regulation, and nothing for wage workers of any kind, the way that their lives were organized, okay, or hurt, whether it was healthcare or um, unions or whatever it is. I mean, simply, there was no Republican message for uh, wage laborers of any kind in that convention. Um, I think that that's part of the atmosphere in which Donald Trump rose. I mean, he at least, on the surface, not in any substantive way, but at least on the surface, made a place for um, you know, wage workers in Ohio and in Michigan. And even won Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania on the basis of this kind of appeal. Now, it's hard.
hard for me to, to accept in a certain way because he hasn't proposed any ideas that relate to these things or any kind of interesting policy. Um, but there was a huge gap in Republican, in the Republican message and approach that ignored a large group of people and that did not have creative and interesting things to say. And that helped explain Trump, I think. It was not as though the party was in good shape before he, he um, you know, took, took that influence. In fact, I think one reason he took that influence was that it was in pretty bad shape. I also would apply that to you know, an American first message because of Iraq, Afghanistan, global war on terror. People were very tired of, of these exertions. Um, and I think that also provided an opportunity for him to talk about, let's care for our own. We don't care about our people people overseas, we're tired of caring about the world. Um, so yeah, I would be highly critical of some of what you know, kind of led to the rise of, of Trump. Um, and I think that Republicans have a lot of fault in, you know, I would probably assess the blame a little differently than you might, um, because I am a market-oriented person, um, but, uh, Yeah, I, I think it's a prerequisite, though, for people to be involved in, from left to right, in political change, is that they have to apologize for their past. It's going to be very difficult. Okay, I mean it, that's just not normally the way you build political movements. Okay, um, but I I think that there is, um, you know, I could make some criticisms on the left too about the way they treat religious institutions, the way they've dealt with life issues, the way that you know, um, and uh, you know my. I will tell you that my initial political instincts when I was in high school um, were to be supportive of Jimmy Carter, who was an evangelical. Kind of talk of, he was a, a racial justice Southern governor um, and was a contrast to the, the, the moral squalor of the Nixon years. Okay. Um, but I was pro-life. And then you get to Dukakis and you get to Mandel and you begin demonizing religious people as sources of intolerance, which became a democratic um, talking point. And I think they made huge mistakes in the way that they dealt with some of these, these trends. But I, I, I would say the same on the, on the Republican side as well. And I, I think that, I mean, I would go so far as to say that it's one of the reasons that Trump is there. You know, I mean, it, 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 didn't, it didn't come from nowhere. Um, but the, the solution itself has proved to be even more problematic than the problem. bipartisan and having a sense of collective resolve when what they believe as well as what they do is immoral and unethical and for me to align myself or support them or to be silent in order to make things nicer is
Well, if, if you read my writing, you'll understand that I share your concerns often. Um, and in fact, I probably go over the line sometimes in my criticisms of the president uh, because of that same feeling that there's something fundamental going on, a kind of destruction of norms that are hurting our country in a very deep way. Today. And I, I agree with that. But I guess I would only dispute one thing, which is when I quote Martin Luther King, for example, talking about the strength of love, he talked about this a lot. Um, that was not a refusal to confront people with injustice. I mean, in fact, that's what he did his career. I mean, he confronted injustice directly, rhetorically, but also through you know, nonviolent resistance. And, um, but the ultimate goal there, the way that he talked about it, was not um, to hate people that engaged in injustice, but somehow to reach them over time. Okay. The goal was that they had value to it. Um, and that was a hard thing when you're talking about you know, brutal policemen beating up children on the edge of a public bridge. That must have been very hard. And there were people in the civil rights movement that didn't agree with King on that. Um, but I think that that was a very important um, insight in how social healing takes place, um, is that the goal is not to destroy your enemies in a democracy. It, it has to somehow be um, not necessarily to convert them, but to treat them in such a way that change can take place over time. Um, and I, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, but I think it is a kind of a, I think the example of the civil rights movement makes some sense in this context. I mean, they, the goal of the movement was to preserve the possibility of healing in the aftermath of injustice. And we have to think about that too. Because I, um, you know, it's 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 very easy to um, become the image, the mirror image of what you disdain. I mean, I find that to be my true human nature. And what do you think it is that has allowed this single individual to exert such power, such control over people who you would have thought were self? Well, the, the short version is, I mean, there are a lot of people that view politics as a conflict between good people and bad people. Okay. You know, the children of light and children of darkness. That's true on both sides. You get a lot of that. My view of political leadership has always been that there is good and bad, but that the line goes through every human soul. Okay. And that there is um, not between parties, not between groups of individuals, but within every human being. The goal of politics, the best goal of politics, is to be like Lincoln did and others, is to call on people, the better angels of people's nature, the best side of who they are, okay, and emphasize those things. Donald Trump is very, very effective in becoming an intuitive way of calling out the worst in people. I mean, the kind of, we all have this element of all have this notion that our problems are caused by somebody else's success. Okay. Um, and he sees it. You know. And you know, political leadership can do that. Um, it's happened many times in Western history. Um, and um, so the question is, you know, we need to be essentially pushing for a kind of leadership that speaks to people better than angels. Um, and under those circumstances, a lot of those people that support, for example, if you're talking about um, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, if you look at the numbers, a lot of those people that supported Donald Trump, put him over the top of the presidency, were people who voted for Barack Obama. Um, and so they had, at least one time in their lives, they had a different type of leadership appeal the same people. Okay. Um, and I 
think that that's what we need to, you know, hope for a kind of political leadership that runs a positive race and, and, and works. One more question. That's great. I wish I were more optimistic. Um, I, I was with a, um, a Democrat who I like recently who is um, not pro-life, but is not militantly pro-choice, okay? Who I was asking, why don't you run for president? I mean, you know, you could do it as a centrist and try to appeal to people, moderate Republicans, and, you know, and his response to me is, because of the, of the more moderate things I say on the life issue, I could never get the Democratic nominee. And I think that that's correct in this environment. I think that that is the strongest commitment of the modern Democratic Party, the most consistent commitment. And, you know, that wasn't true even in the Jimmy Carter years, okay? I mean, he was mixed. Bill Clinton was a little bit mixed when he talked about safely going away, or at least he was not talking about. Um, but the, ten, the, the strong tendency in this kind of key, move, key element of the Democratic Party is increasingly not to, is to be proud of their support for abortions themselves. That's the trend, really. And we got that at the last Democratic convention. And, you know, they took out the, um, of the Democratic um, uh, platform, I mean, they put in support for, fed, uh, for government funding for abortions, which they had not had, you know, in, until this last um, election. Um, I would be very open, you know, I, I could have worked and would have worked for Governor Casey of Pennsylvania when, if he was, when he was thinking about running for president. He was the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania, pro-life governor. Um, and, was a social justice politician. I would have no problems whatsoever supporting a candidate like that. But he was ostracized in his own party. Um, and, uh, and I think that that was a terrible mistake on their part. I think, I think you're exactly right. I mean, some of this is just saying, the other side might even have an argument. You know, just a little openness, saying that it's not, um, that it's not obvious. Um, and I don't see much evidence of that right now, but you know, there, I'll just say in conclusion that um, when people think they're going to win, or they can win, like Democrats do now, they think they can win, there are two really approaches. One of them is to try to be a centrist and pull off support from your opponent's party and build a new coalition. The other is, now is our chance to get everything we want without compromise. And I see that spirit in the Democratic Party in a lot of ways that just says, he's weak. This is our chance to get everything we want. Instead of saying, he's weak, this is a chance to redo our coalition in a way that will be favorable to the long-term interests of the party. But that's exactly what Republicans do when they win, too. They don't say, let's build coalitions. They say, let's get everything we want. But I think that's a serious kind of issue in our